Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The following program is transcribed. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents... This is your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. During the past few weeks, thousands of postcards have been mailed by Equitable Society representatives. Thousands of personal phone calls have been made, urging people to pay particular attention to the commercial on this Equitable program tonight. When you hear this message, you'll understand why. It tells about the Equitable Society's independent 60s plan. A practical, workable plan for men and women who want to be completely self-supporting when they reach the age of 60. I'll give full details in about 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Respectable Thief. The success of swindlers in this country and the fact that they collect millions of dollars every year from unsuspecting citizens is all the warning against them any alert person should need. There is no reason for the continuing success that swindlers enjoy, except for the fact that every year they find a new crop of people who are looking for a pot of gold at the end of a man-made rainbow. That most of their stories are engrossing is true. That most of them are extremely personable and charming people is also true. But those two things are not reasons for investing your money with a stranger. Rather, they should make you cautious. Two major factors in the success of our nation's swindlers are the joint facts that no law enforcement agency can stop a swindler before he commits his crime. And that once he has done his work, it is frequently too late to recover the money he has stolen. For those reasons, it will pay you well to remember one cardinal rule. Investigate before you invest. Tonight's file opens in the private office of Walter Stevens, located in the downtown skyscraper of a large eastern city. Mr. Stevens' secretary has just ushered in a visitor, one Mr. Marshall. Sit down, Marshall. Okay. Here. Yeah. Cigar? Never use it. How about a drink? I've got some... Look, I... Mr. Stevens, you don't have to romance me like I'm a customer. Let's get down to business, huh? Very well. Who told you about me? Ned Hollinger. Oh. You, uh... You might be pleased to know that Ned thinks you're the best in the business. That's fine. So, in the strength of that praise, I called you. We'll write down this name and address. I'd rather just remember things. Oh? Well, what is it? Victor Brown, 215 North Adams Street. He's a man about 50 with gray hair. He wears glasses Mr. And... Stevens. Yes? Before we go any further, let's get the financial arrangements straightened out, huh? I figured on paying you 500. That's not enough. How about a thousand? What did Ned Hollinger tell you, Judge? A thousand. A man like you must know that the price of everything has gone up. All right, you name it. Two thousand. 
that, that's pretty steep. That's the number, Mr. Stevens. Well, okay. That's a deal? Yes. Oh, one other thing. This must look like suicide. That'll cost you another 500. Now, wait a minute. Cherry on the cake, Mr. Stevens. All right. When do you want it done? Tonight. <laughs> Ted. Yeah, honey? I hate to bother you with this right after dinner, but I'd like you to go over these bills with me. Huh? What bills? Oh, grocery, butcher, milkman. I just can't make it work anymore, honey. I'm just going to have to have a bigger allowance. Look, some other time with that Jonah. I'm trying to think something out. Oh, I'm sorry. What's the trouble? I get a commission today. Who from? A guy named Walter Stevens. Uh-huh. He wants me to knock off an old gentleman named Victor Brown. I don't know. I can't figure it. Why not? This Mr. Brown lives on Adams Street over a dirty saloon. Yeah? I went over, got a line on the guy. Well, what's he like? Yeah, he gets loaded every day, goes upstairs, sleeps it off, then he comes down to the saloon for more. The thing that's got me, though, is I can't figure why Stevens wants him taken care of. Well, maybe he knows something. It'd have to be real important. Where's he get the money to drink all day? He had a job up to a couple of days ago. How'd you find that out? I talked to the old guy. What's his Stevens paying for the job? Twenty-five hundred. Well, that's pretty high. He isn't having the old man knocked off because he's a drunk. You can bet on that. Yeah, and you can bet on something else. If it's worth twenty-five hundred to Stevens to have him taken care of, it might be worth a lot more to us to find out why. When'd you say you'd do the killing? Tonight. Any special time? No. Yeah. Well, let's go over these bills first, then, huh? Meanwhile, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just approaching the desk of Agent Norman Grant. You busy, Norman? No, Jim, I just got to sign this report. Okay. There, that one's finished. Uh, don't lean back and relax, Norm. The boss just put you on a case I'm working on. Well, that was a short vacation. <laughs> What's this one about? Some Boy Scouts were out hiking on Sunday up in the hills. They ran across a body. Where? Just off Fire Trail 23 up in the National Park. They called the police. The police called us in. Well, how long had the body been there? Medical examiner said the man had been dead about a year. Oh, I don't imagine any identification was possible then. No, no physical ident. But near the body, which had been buried in a shallow grave, the scoutmaster found an address book. Could you still read anything in it? Yeah, it was pretty well preserved. Was the owner's name in the book? No. Oh, I sent it down to the lab, had them smoke up all the pages so we could read the names and addresses. How'd the job come out? Fine. The lab did a great job on it. Well, then I called every person in the book. We had them list any friend who might have had their address, or a friend they hadn't heard from in a year. The name Dodge turned up on a dozen of the lists. Well, then I checked back with every one of them and found out who the dead man was. Who was he? Well, do you remember the disappearance about a year ago of a man named Paul Dodge? Mm, no, not particularly, Jim. I was in the San Francisco office last year. Oh, that's right. I forgot that. Well, Paul Dodge was a bookkeeper who disappeared completely. Shortly thereafter, his employer, a man named Walter Jones, went through bankruptcy. Who was Jones? Oh, a promoter. He was engaged in promoting a new airport here in town at the time. And, of course, his bankruptcy cost a lot of local people their wartime savings. Well, if Dodge was buried up in the hills, wouldn't you say that it's certainly safe to assume that he was murdered, Jim? Yeah, no doubt about that. Well, where is this Walter Jones? He left town shortly after the bankruptcy. Norm, I think our job now is to see if we can find Jones. Is he here, Ted? Uh-huh. There he is, back in the rear booth. Want me to wait at the bar? No, baby, come on back with me. He's a nice old guy. He love talking to him. Hello, Mr. Brown. Oh, hello there, son. Uh, Mr. Brown, this is my wife. Oh, how, uh, how do you do? Hello. <laughs> do you mind if we sit down with you? Oh, no, 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 please do. Well, thank you. Oh. What do you want to drink, honey? Rye and ginger. Okay, how about you, Mr. Brown? Straight bourbon. Huh? Two rye and ginger, one straight bourbon. Right, coming up. Oh, I'm, I'm very pleased that you were able to, well, to stop by here again. Well, I told the wife about it, and she wanted to see the place. You live in the neighborhood, do you? No, no. Oh, that's a pity. I was hoping I... 
Well, I'd have the pleasure of, of your congenial company often. Are you in here a lot, Mr. Brown? Well, I commute between here and my apartment upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Here's your drinks. Oh, thanks. That's a buck eighty. All right. Hey, yeah, keep change. Thanks. Mr. Brown, how can you spend so much time here? Are you in the banking business? Would that I were, young lady. I guess a wife means that you live like one. Oh, I'm a man of many trades. Banking has never been one of them. My last employment was bookkeeping for an investment company. Oh? Which one, Mr. Brown? I worked for a man named Walter Stevens. He was organizing a stock issue for a television network. Uh -huh. Didn't you like it there? Oh, up to a point, I did. And then I... Oh, well, well I, I shan't burden you with my problem. Oh, no, no, talk them out, Mr. Brown. It'll do you good. No, no, it's a private matter. Say, uh, let's have another drink. Okay, I'll call a bartender. Oh, no, no, never mind. I'll go up and get them. Charlie yeah. doesn't serve the tables well, when there's anybody at the bar. Pardon oh, me. Sure. Yeah, sure. sure. Honey, I think I know what this is all about. You do? Yeah. Now, I'm not going to do anything to this old man until I have another talk with Stevens. You stay here with Mr. Brown. I'll be back later. <laughs> Jim, here's a further report from the medical examiner on Paul Dodge. Oh? Two bullet holes through the head. Well, that clinches the murder theory. The police are digging around where the body was found to see if they can locate any bullets. Good. Might help if they can find some. Did you get anything on the man he worked for, this uh, Walter Jones? Well, yes and no. What do you mean? I discovered some things that make his bankruptcy seem awful suspicious, but I don't know where he is. Where did the trail lead to? Well, I started at the apartment hotel where he used to live. He moved out of there a few days after the bankruptcy. Did they have any forwarding address? No, but the transportation desk at the hotel fortunately keeps records. Oh. They told me that he bought a compartment on a train for Miami Beach when he left. Mm -hmm. They also told me what hotel he'd gone to, so I called our office down in Miami and had them check. Well, did they come up with anything? I found out that Jones had spent an awful lot of money gambling when he was down there last year. Oh, sounds like it was a profitable bankruptcy. It certainly does. Then from Miami, Jones went to Philadelphia. Well, let's notify the Philadelphia office to locate and interview him. I did that. Jones can't be located. Mm. Say, we're due in Philly to be witnesses in the forest kidnapping case tomorrow morning. Yeah, I know. As soon as we're through in court, I think we'll do a little checking up. Hello, Mr. Stevens. Huh? Doing a little work on the books? Well, how did it go? It didn't. What? Ron is still alive. What's the idea? The price has changed. What do you mean? I had a talk with the old guy. Look, we made a deal, Marshal. Yeah, that's right. I didn't know when we made it what your angle was. No, I do. You collected a lot of dough to start a television network. Now you're going to skip with it and hang the shortage on old man Brown, huh? Marshal, even if that were true, it wouldn't be any of your business. It is when it affects the price. There's a new line in this race. I won 50% of the whole deal. Are you kidding? No. Look, look, forget about Brown. I'll get somebody else to do the job. Oh, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Well, what can you do about it? Go to the cops. You think they'd believe someone like you with a record? Oh, I wouldn't tell them who I am. I'd just call them on the phone, give them a tip. That's all. Marshal. Yeah. How about 25%? Uh-uh. I want 50. And I want it in cash. Now I'll just make myself comfortable here till you okay the deal. Ted! still in the saloon? No. Where is he? Oh, he got very drunk and very unhappy. Had to take him upstairs to his apartment. Is he up there now? No. Yeah. Let's go up. Get your deal straightened out? Uh-huh. We go in here and up a flight of stairs. Mm. What's the old guy unhappy about? Because oh, he was a failure. Used to be a big man, he said. Oh. Didn't stop drinking. Became a bum. The bartender said he straightened himself out when he went to work for Stevens. And all of a sudden, he started drinking again. 
think I know his reason. Why? Yeah, it's a long story. All I can tell you is he gets a dirty deal. Poor old guy. You gonna kill him now? Mm-hmm. That's his room there. Left his door unlocked. Okay, baby. Holy. Joan, come here. What is it? What's the matter? Oh. There's a bullet hole right through the old man's head. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI helps promote national security. Now let's talk briefly about another kind of security. Security for men and women who want to look forward to independent 60s. What's that mean? Financial independence after you're 60 years old? That's it exactly, Bruce. Independent 60s means that you've got a regular monthly income guaranteed for life. You're not asking help from anyone. So what you do is your own business. To you, Bruce, independent 60s may mean a chance to catch up with all the fishing you've missed in your busy years. I can see you in your outboard motorboat with a look in your eyes that says you're going to get the biggest muskie in the lake. Or to another man, independent 60s means a pleasant home in a friendly little town with a garden and a workshop and a place to pitch horseshoes. But no matter what your picture may be, why not do something about it right now? Take the first step towards a better future by investigating the independent 60s plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. I've heard those plans are pretty expensive, Mr. Keating. Guess I'd better wait a few more years before I start investigating. Well, if that's all that's holding you back, Bruce, then your Equitable Society representative has a very pleasant surprise for you. He'll work out an independent 60s plan that's geared to your present income. Actually, if you're between the ages of 30 and 45 and covered by Social Security, you'll be amazed how little this Equitable plan costs considering how much it does for you. At any rate, it costs absolutely nothing to find out. Your Equitable Society representative will give you the facts. Get in touch with him soon. Or write care of this station to the home office of the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to tonight's file... The Respectable Thief. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI once more brings home the truly callous emotions of the professional criminal. The man who attempts to make his living through pillage or arson or murder. He brings to his work many attributes this man who must inevitably fail. But foremost among his characteristics, there is an utter disregard for his fellow man. If the untimely death of one of those fellow men, or more than one, will bring the criminal further surcease from labor, then that fellow man who stands in his way must die. He has no compunctions about it, no pangs of conscience. To him, it is perfectly obvious that only the strong deserve to live and that those who are strong are at liberty to assert their strength in any manner they choose, even when that assertion of strength carries with it someone else's verdict of doom. Tonight's file continues in the shabby apartment of the late Victor Brown. Poor old man. Killed himself. Yeah. Did you uh, touch anything in his room when you brought him up? No, why? The boy isn't having any fingerprints found in here. Aren't you going to take the gun out of his hand? What for? It's supposed to make it look like a suicide, and I don't have to bother. Ted. What? How does this help Stephen? Well, he goes through bankruptcy and says the old guy stole all his money. Oh. Then he keeps the money. Yeah, not all of us. That's what I want to talk to him about. We get 50%. Yeah? What's that come to? About 50 G's. Honey, when do you get it? In the morning when I see Stevens. Come on, baby, let's get out of here. Well, 
Jim. We're free to work on the Jones case. Why? What happened? The Forrest kidnapping case has been continued until next Monday. That's good. Oh, I've been doing a little work on Jones this morning. Find anything? Yes, I had his picture with me, and I found a hotel clerk who recognized him. Unfortunately, he moved out six months ago. Where to? I don't know that yet, but the clerk did tell me two things. The first is, Jones has changed his name. To what? Walter Stevens. The other is, he saw Stevens here in Philadelphia yesterday. Where? Coming out of a restaurant down on Broad Street. Oh, did he remember what restaurant? Yes, I went over there, but apparently Stevens isn't a regular customer. They didn't know who he was. Well, at least we know he's here. Yeah. Oh, I asked the local police to check, see if they could find out where he lived or where his office was. And I looked in the phone book, and the only Walter Stevens that's listed isn't the one we want. Oh, I see. Oh, excuse me. Sure. Special Agent Taylor. Hello, Mr. Taylor. This is Sergeant Warren. Yes, hello, Sergeant. Your Mr. Stevens has an office in the Wright Building, under the name of the Broadlawn Television Network Company. The Wright Building. And that's the Broadlawn Television Network Company. Is that it? Thanks very much, Sergeant. Not at all. Goodbye. Why? We've got a lead on Stevens, Norm. Oh? Look, will you check here and see what you can find out about the uh, uh, Broadlawn Television Network Company? Sure. I'll go up and see if I can have a talk with him. Hello? Hello, Mr. Stevens. That you, Marshal? Yeah. What do you want? Just call to tell you everything went okay last night. You took care of it? Sure. The old man give you much of a fight? A little. You're a liar. What did you say? I got a letter from Brown in this morning's mail. It was a suicide note. Oh. Well, what are you beefing about? Ain't that how you wanted it to look? Yes. I'll be up to your office in half an hour for my dough. Don't waste your time. Look. Money is coming to me. I'm going to get it. You're not getting a dime. Mr. Stevens, I wouldn't talk like that if I was you. You made a deal. My part is finished. You're finished too, Marshal. Goodbye. I kept you waiting, Norm. That's okay, Jim. Traffic's pretty heavy. I just got down myself. How'd you make out? I didn't. I just missed Stephen. That was his office, though. Yeah? And from all I gathered, it's another of his blue sky propositions. I found that much out while you were gone. Huh? We got a phone call from a Mr. Pine. Who's he? One of the men who invested his money with Stevens. How come he called the office? Well, he said he got a letter in this morning's mail from a man named Victor Brown. Uh Mm-hmm. He said he was going to commit suicide, but before he did, he wanted to tell him some things. Uh, who was Brown? He was Stephen's bookkeeper. Oh. According to Pine's story, Brown was out of work for some time before he got the job with Stevens, and he was so grateful to him that he got all of his friends to invest their money. Tell me, did uh, Brown commit suicide? Yes, I checked. He killed himself last night in his apartment. Oh. What else he tell this Mr. Pine in the letter? That he had discovered that Stevens was stealing the funds of the company and trying to pin it on him. I see, and then decided he couldn't face them when he found out what was going on. That's right. Poor guy. Did you find anything at all at Stevens' office, Jim? Nothing much. Some charred papers and a wastebasket. Stevens had been in this morning, all right. I guess he burned everything that might have proved damaging to him. Where does he live? We might catch him at home. No one in the office knows where he lives. He seemed to be very careful to keep that a secret, Norm. Yeah, it's obvious why. Yeah, it is now. Where are we headed for, Jim? The bank where the Broadlawn Television Network Company has an account. Let's hope they know where Stevens lives. What have you got there, Jim? These are all the canceled checks from the Broadlawn Television Network Company's account. Oh, good. Yeah, Mr. Hubbard said we could use this desk here. Okay. Sit over there. Right. Really? Mm-hmm. Well, except for the salary checks for the people up at the office, Stevens doesn't seem to have drawn checks to anyone but himself. That sounds like him. Mm. Oh, Stevens also keeps his personal account here. Are we going to get the canceled checks on that account, too? Yeah. Mr. Hubbard said he'd bring them over as soon as his girl got them out of the files. Uh, Mr. Hubbard didn't have a home address on Stevens, did he, Jim? No. No, both the business and the personal accounts gave only his office address. Here's Stevens' personal checks. I'm sorry we were so long in getting them. Oh, it's all right. Thanks very much, Mr. Hubbard. I hope they'll be of some help to you. We do, too. 
You'll be able to keep the name of the bank out of all this, won't you? I'm sure we will, sir. Thank you very much. Not at all. Hey, Norm, this is more like it. Why didn't we get these first? Come on, let's get to a phone. Who's there? Telegram, Mr. Stevens. Oh, step back, Stevens. Get your hands up. I told you you'd fall for that old gag, honey. What are you doing here? What do you think? Who told you where I lived? Nobody. I'll tell you last night after you left your office. You didn't think I trusted you, did you? This isn't going to help you. It ain't going to hurt me, none either. Give me my money, you phony chiseler. Ted, look over there. He's all packed and ready to leave. Yeah. Come on, Stevens, up with the door. Where is it? That's my business. But I got the gun. I'll give you 30 seconds to come up with that money, Stevens. If you don't, this gun goes off. Drop that uh, gun. Uh, Pick up his gun, Norm. Right. I'm, I'm certainly glad you men got here when you did. These people forced their way in here. They were just holding me up. I'll save that for the jury, Stevens. We're special agents of the FBI. So what? Yes, you're the one we came here to get. Catching these two is just velvet. All right, Norm, let's take them all downtown. Walter Stevens was tried, convicted, and executed for the murder on a government reservation of Paul Dodge, his first bookkeeper. Ted Marshall was found to have been previously wanted for murder. He, too, was prosecuted, convicted, and executed on this charge. His wife, June, was given a life sentence for conspiracy to commit murder. The solution to tonight's case was brought about by the bank investigation. In going over canceled checks, one of the checks in Stevens' personal account was found to be made out to the Winona Taylor shop. A phone call to the shop revealed Stevens' home address. And thus armed, your FBI was able to close the careers of these criminals. Sometimes, as in tonight's case, a criminal will seemingly escape unpunished after having committed as grave a crime as murder. But as the records show, he never really escapes. It may take a month or a year or 15 years to catch him, but ultimately, the clock runs out for every criminal because your FBI is not an organization with a short memory. However long it takes, no file is ever forgotten or put away until there is a rubber stamp affixed to the first page. A rubber stamp which spells out one word. The word, convicted. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's case from the files of your FBI. Now three final questions on the Equitable Society's Independent 60s plan. Mr. Keating, suppose I start a plan now, and then my income goes up in the next few years. Can I increase the amount of my Independent 60s plan? An excellent idea. Your Equitable Society representative will be glad to lay out a plan like that for you. Well, what about my Social Security? Is that a factor to consider? It certainly is. Your Equitable Society representative will show you how to make it dovetail with your independent 60s plan. Oh, what income will, I, uh, will it give me in my 60s? Your Equitable Society representative will give you the exact figure. Either get in touch with him soon or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case that involves the bold operations of a receiver of stolen goods. Its subject, hijacking. Its title, the three-way frame-up. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. 
the three-way frame-up on This Is Your FBI. The preceding program came to you by transcription. The following program is transcribed. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. During the past few days, in every city, town, and county, representatives of the Equitable Life Assurance Society have been sending postcards to people in their neighborhood. The purpose of these postcards from Equitable Society representatives was to urge their neighbors to listen to the main commercial in tonight's Equitable broadcast. It's addressed to men and women who want to be self-supporting and independent after they're 60 years old. If that's the way you feel you'll be interested in the independent 60s plan worked out by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. I'll give full details in about 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Three-Way Frame-Up. Crime in the United States is an established business, and unfortunately, that business is very good. You read a note in your newspaper about a robbery or a holdup, or you hear about one on your favorite radio news program, and you are likely to forget it quickly because few holdups are dramatic enough to impress themselves upon you. But do not be under the mistaken belief that those thefts are isolated and the result of any accident. The majority of them are well planned, and more than that, Many of them are the result of work by groups of tightly knit gangs. That those gangs enjoyed a banner year in the past 12 months is shown by the figures recently gathered by your FBI in a nationwide survey into the field of crime. The value of property stolen last year in the United States totaled more than $113 million, or an average of $2.5 million a week. That figure should impress you law-abiding citizens because that $113 million was your money. Tonight's file opens in the lavishly furnished apartment of Alice and George Hopkins. It is mid-afternoon, and George has just come in. George? Yeah? What are you doing home so early? I don't feel well. Oh, I'm sorry, honey. Can I get you something? No, I don't want anything. What's the matter? I just wanted to see Dr. Elliot. He, uh, he examined me with a fluoroscope. What's that? Well, it's, uh, it's like an X-ray machine, only you get the pictures right there without waiting. What did he say? I've got an ulcer. You've got it? I've got to take it easy. Oh, George, that's awful. Well, I don't like to be an I told you so, but I've been telling you right along you've been working too hard. I know, and you've told me to take it easy. But how can I? I run a one-man business. The cemeteries are full of people who ran a one-man business. What else did the doctor say? Oh, I've got to give up work for a while. Go away. Well, George, that's wonderful. You haven't had a vacation in years. I know, but I don't think I should take one. Why not? Well, who will run my business? Oh, now, George. No, I mean it. Well, there must be somebody to take over while you're gone. Who? Who can I trust? Well, h- how about Bob Nelson? Well, I, I, I thought of him. And? I'm not sure he's had enough experience. But George, he's been with you a long time. Alice, Alice, you must realize that length of service is no barometer for talent. But he's very clever at stealing things. You told me that. There's a great deal of difference between being a thief and a fence. My business is receiving stolen goods. But he's been helping you. I know. Well, then why don't you give him a chance? Oh, now, look, honey, well, I... I'm only suggesting it so that you can get away. I realize that, but... Oh, now, look, look, this isn't good for my ulcer. Get, get me some water. I've got to take some pills. We'll talk this over later. Who 
is it? Me, Bob. Alex. Oh. Hi, baby. Hi. Got any whiskey in the house? Sure. And mix us some drinks. We got something to celebrate. What? George saw a doctor this afternoon. He's sick. No kidding. Yeah. The doc says he's got to go away. Is he going? Yeah. Is that what we're celebrating? No. This drink will be to you. I don't get it. You're the new head man. Huh? George had to get somebody to run the business while he's gone. I sold him on you. Well, thanks, baby. Here. He's going to call you later. What's the matter with him? Oh, he claims he's got an ulcer, but you know the way he belly aches all the time. He won't be happy till they name a new disease after him. How long is he going to be gone? Six months. That should give you all the time you need. For what? Take his business over, permanently. Oh. Would you drink to that? Sure, baby. There's only one thing to remember. What? I go with the job. You think I'd want to forget that? No. How about another drink? Not now. I've got to hurry back to the house. After all, I'm George's ever-loving, dutiful wife until he leaves town. Come in. It's open. Hello, doll. Oh, Bob, honey. I didn't expect you here tonight, sugar. Honey, I just came by to tell you that you get ready to move out of this crumb hotel. Why? George Hopkins got sick, and he's got to get out of town. Well, how does that make me move out of here? I'm going to take over his business while he's gone. Oh. Don't you realize what that means, honey? All those things I promised you, you can have every one of them. Even the mink coat? Two mink coats. One for when it rains. Oh, well, that's wonderful, Bob. Hey, I thought you and George didn't get along too good. Uh, he didn't pick me for the job. His wife did. Oh? Oh, now, don't get mad, honey. She don't mean anything to me. Well, why did she pick you then? She stuck on me. Oh, Bob. Well, look, I can't help it. Well, you must have encouraged her. I didn't, honey, honest. But we'll have to be careful for a little while. Where we go together and, and, and things like that. Why? Because she thinks I'm stuck on her. That I'm going to cut up the business with her as soon as George leaves town. But as soon as I take over, baby. It's just you and me. <laughs> Next morning at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just greeting Agent Ike Woodford. Hello, Ike. Hey, when'd you get back? Just this morning, Jim. You're a great guy. Hey, must have been a good vacation. Oh, it was wonderful. Plenty of sunshine, plenty of fishing. Hey, what'd you catch? Speckled trout. Huh? Now, I know this is an old cliche, Jim, but one got away that must have weighed at least... Ike, I'll bet it wasn't as heavy as this case you've been assigned to. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> what is the case, Jim? Hijacking. Nothing's changed much since I left. I think maybe we got a break on this case, though. Well, that's good. We found one of the trucks out on Highway 37. Abandoned? Yeah. Nothing new about that, Jim. We found trucks before. But this one was still loaded and stolen goods. Uh huh. This truck hit a soft shoulder on the road, ran off into a ditch. I see. It was filled with about $11,000 worth of stolen drugs and headed for here. Well, how do you know that, Jim? Well, we found a note in the cab of the truck saying that the shipment was due to be delivered to the warehouse here. No other address on the note, huh? No. Police are over at Madison are checking up on the truck now. Well, the driver just took off, I assume. That's right. I got to thinking about it, though, after I saw the truck, and I figured that maybe he was injured when he went off the road. So I checked with all the hospitals around Madison. Sure enough, guy came in with a dislocated shoulder to be treated. Did they have his name? Well, they had a name, but it wasn't the right one. He also gave him a phony address. I see. That's why I said we may have one break, though. The man who was treated for the dislocated shoulder left his shirt and undershirt at the hospital after they put on the cast. Well, let's hope we can get something from the laundry marks. The lab is working on that now, Ike. As soon as they give us the word, we'll start moving. Alice, get me a glass of water, will you? You gonna take some more of those pills? So quick? My stomach is killing me. What time is it? Ten after ten. Oh, where is Bob Nelson? He should have been here ten minutes ago. Oh, I didn't know you called him. 
Here. Oh, yeah, thanks. Well, I don't know what's what's in that medicine, but it, it sure helps. Maybe you better get an extra box for while you're gone. Oh, I've already ordered a whole case. Good. Hey, hey. Oh, that must be Nelson now. Uh, go let him in, will you? Okay. Hello, Mrs. Hopkins. Please come in. Oh, thank you. Hello, Nelson. Hello, George. Sorry to hear about your health. Yeah, it's awful, just awful. The doctor told me this is the worst ulcer he's seen in 35 years of practice. Well, you better take care of it, George. No, I'm going to. I'm leaving town in an hour. Hey, go, go sit down and let's get right down to business, huh? Can I get anything for you, Mr. Nelson? Yeah, no, thanks. Hey, you better sit down too, Alice. All right, all right. Now, uh, this, uh, this list here, Bob, uh, this is our list of contacts. They all ship stuff to the warehouse. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Now, this, uh, this list here, yeah, this... These are the people who get rid of the stuff for you, depending on what kind of stuff it is. I see. And here, um, yeah, here's the lease on the warehouse. It's made out in the name of the ABC Corporation. Well, that's you. No, no, that's you. It's whoever runs the warehouse. There is no ABC Corporation, really. Oh, I get it. The names marked with the stars on that second sheet, Mr. Nelson, that means they can only be contacted at night. Yeah, 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 I forgot to tell you that. They're supposed to be legitimate people, so don't bother them during the day. Okay. Uh, what else? I'll be back here in six months, Bob. Just see that nobody gets out of line with you. If you do that, the place will run itself. I'll be tough. Don't oh, worry. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you get stuck on anything, just uh, just ask Alice. <laughs> she knows as much about the business as I do. Fine. Thanks. Then after a few weeks, when she's sure you got everything running smooth, she's uh, she's going to come out and, uh, and join me. Uh, you won't mind if I come for you for some advice from time to time, William is not? No, no, not at all. In fact, I'd like you to call on me. That way I'll be sure to protect George's interests. Mike, any word from the police? No, not yet, Jim. They checked that laundry over an hour ago, and it was the right place. That's good. Maybe they've set up a surveillance at the driver's house. Probably. Well, there's nothing any of us can do now but wait until he comes home. I hope they get more from him than I got from the owner of that truck. Oh, I didn't know you saw him. Oh, that's, that's right. You were in with the boss when that call came in from the Madison police. I thought that was a stolen truck, Jim. Yeah, so did I, but it wasn't. Well, I wonder why the driver took the trouble to remove the license plates then. Oh, he must have forgotten in his panic that we could check the motor and serial numbers. At any rate, the owner turned out to be a man named Joe Spencer. Mm, never heard of him. Well, he's not a local. He's from over in Madison. Police had no trouble in picking him up. Did he admit owning the truck? Yes, but he claims he had no idea what was in it. He says he only uses the truck during the day and that his driver must have loaded it with the stolen drugs. <laughs> That's a likely story. He made it even more implausible by saying that he had just hired the driver. Didn't even have his name or address on record. Well, he certainly sounds like he's mixed up in this thing. Oh, up to his ears. Jim. Oh, yes, Carl. This teletype just came in from police headquarters for you. Oh, swell. Thanks, Carl. Is uh, that about the driver? Yeah, his name is Eddie Leslie, Ike. Hey, he's told the police his whole story. Including the location of the warehouse here in town? Yes, it's at 989 Franklin Avenue. The police are on their way there now. I'd better go over and meet them. Just a minute. Bob. Out of the way, you... Alice. Bob, what's the matter with you? What did you take me for? A square, a chump, an out-of-the-town Elmer? You know I've got a good wait mind Wait a to... minute, wait a minute. What's this all about? Great little deal you handed me. What are you talking about? I just went by the warehouse. The joint is crawling with cops. What? They're all over the place. And every one of them is looking for me. Bob. Uh, you and that husband of yours tried to frame me, didn't you? Don't I take the rap for your phony deal? Oh, Bob, why would I frame you? I made George go away so we could be together. Ah, oh, don't give me that. Well, it's the truth. I swear it is. Well, then George framed both of us. What do you mean? Take a look at this note. I just picked it up in my apartment. Who's it from? My girl, Helen. You've got a girl? I did have a girl. She's just run away with your husband, George. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI helps promote national security. Now let's talk briefly about another kind of security. Security for men and women who want to look forward to independent 60s. Uh, what do you mean, independent 60s? It means that you're not accepting one cent of charity after you're 60 years old. 
You don't have to live in someone else's house. You're still enjoying life. To one man, independent 60s means a home of his own in the country. Yes, eggs from your own chickens, fruit from your own orchard, vegetables from your own garden. Or, to another man, independent 60s means travel, going south for the winter. But whatever independent 60s means to you, the thing to do is to stop wishing and hoping for it and start doing something about it right now. Start by investigating the Independent 60s plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Well, sounds fine if a man can afford it. But what am I going to use for money? Well, if that's all that's holding you back, Tom, then your Equitable Society representative has a very pleasant surprise for you. He'll work out an Independent 60s plan that's geared to your present income. Actually, if you're between the ages of 30 and 45 and covered by Social Security you'll be amazed how little this equitable plan costs, considering how much it does for you. At any rate, it costs absolutely nothing to find out. Your Equitable Society representative will give you the facts and figures on the Equitable Independent 60s plan. Get in touch with him soon, or write care of this station to the home office of the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to tonight's file, The Three-Way Frame-Up. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI graphically illustrates one important point, and that is that in the mind of the typical criminal, loyalty is a word which means being friendly with the winner. Past friendships, marital ties, alleged love... None of those count for anything in the torturously warped brain of anyone who tries to make his livelihood outside the law. The files of every large law enforcement agency, like your FBI, is liberally studded with cases in which brother has turned on brother, in which child has turned on parent. The only things which govern a criminal's behavior are what's in it for me and who can I frame. As Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, has pointed out, One of the reasons for the present-day high crime rates is the failure on the part of too many citizens to assume the responsibilities of citizenship. Part of your job as a citizen is to see to it that your local police department is well enough manned and financed so that it can do the job it wants to do, so that it can help drive the criminal out of business. Tonight's file continues at the local FBI field office. You look disappointed, Jim. I am. I thought we were going to close this case when we located that warehouse. Did you find anything there? No, when we got there, the place was empty. Doesn't sound like the truck driver told the truth. No, I think he's leveling with us, Ike. Oh, but it doesn't make sense that a drop as big as that one could be empty at any time. Not unless somebody just emptied it. (laughs) Well, the only reason for doing that would be because the owner knew we were on his trail. Maybe he did. Oh, maybe he guessed that his driver would talk. I checked at the Hall of Records on the place, Jim, and that's not much help either. Who's on record as being the owner of the place? An outfit named the ABC Corporation is the lessee of the property, Mm -hmm. and the lease is signed by a G.E. Robertson as president. Have you contacted Robertson? There is no such person. It's a fake name. Another one, huh? Well, maybe the watchman was right. He told me a man named Bob Nelson had been there earlier and said that he was the new boss. I know that name, Jim. Yeah, so do I. I'm having the record section send us everything they've got on him. Maybe we can get a lead from that. The owner of the property that the warehouse stands on is the Don Allen Company. Don Allen Company? They're a legitimate outfit. How did they get mixed up with this? I don't know. Neither did they. They said that they were paid rent every month by the ABC Corporation and never investigated what was going on at the warehouse. It's too bad. If they had, maybe we could have broken this ring a lot sooner. Jim? Oh, yes, Carl. What is it? From the record section. Oh, thanks, Carl. Let's hope this is it. Mm Mm-hmm. Looks like Bob Nelson has a pretty long record. Yeah, he sure has. Hey, Ike, Mm -hmm. take a look at this. Uh, Right there. There's an arrest for selling stolen goods. Sounds like he could be our man. Let's send out an alarm on Nelson right away. Yes, Helen. Ain't you coming in the pool again, sugar? No, I've had enough of the day, honey. This oh. uh, this desert air starts to get chilly. All right. Well, I'll come out too, 
move in. Oh, I'll give you a hand. Oh, oh thanks. Ooh. Uh, dry me off, will you? Oh, sure. Uh, I wonder what time it is. Oh, it's five... Tw- hey. What? You forgot to remind me to take my pills. No, I didn't. Well, where are they? I haven't got them. Well, did you leave them in the cottage? No, I threw them away. Threw them away? Yes, I got sick and tired of playing second fiddle to an ulcer. Oh, but Helen, I... You brought me here for a vacation, sugar, not a rest cure. But I need those pills. Oh, Georgie, that's just your imagination. If you take pills, you think you're sick. If you think you're sick, we don't go out. We came to the desert to have fun. Honey, we've been having fun. We swim every day. You go shopping for clothes. No, well, I want nighttime fun. I want to ride out in the desert, visit the sheik. (laughs) Honey, honey, there are no sheiks in Arizona. Well, then take me dancing. Aren't there places for that? All right, honey. We'll go dancing tonight. Jim, yeah? uh, we've got Bob Nelson and the watchman from that warehouse outside. Oh, good. Ike, will you send Nelson in, please? Right. Oh, and Ike, while I'm interviewing him, why don't you see what you can find out from the watchman? Then we can compare stories later on, okay. huh? Okay. All right, Nelson, this way. Here he is, Jim. Thanks, Ike. Sit down, Nelson. Okay. I'm telling you right now, you guys have got nothing on me. That remains to be seen. I'd like to ask you a few questions, Nelson. Go ahead, ask me anything. Why did you tell the watchman at the warehouse that you were the new boss? I didn't tell him that. I told him I was running things while the boss was away. You were working for somebody else? That's right. Who? George Hopkins. If you ask me where he is, I'll tell you. I don't know. He said he was sick, had to go away. So he went away with my girl. Was he sick? I don't think so. But he was always used to make out he was dying. He had pills to take care of everything. How about that list of contacts the police found in your hotel? Hopkins gave them to me. They're even in his handwriting. Then you knew the warehouse was a drop. Sure, I knew it. I ain't claiming I'm a lily. But you guys got no rap on me because I never operated the warehouse. Ask the watchman if you don't believe me. I will. I... Yes, Jim? Did you ask the watchman how long Nelson had been running a place? Yes, I did. He said he never actually ran it, that we moved in before he had a chance. There, you see? Did the watchman know where Hopkins had gone? No. No, he didn't, Jim. Mm. Maybe you can find out from his wife. No? Where is she? We've got an apartment at 108 West Owens Avenue. Okay. All right, Nelson. We're going to hold you for further questioning. How long? Until we can locate the commissioner and arraign you. In the meantime, Mike, let's get a warrant. Go over and talk to Mrs. Hopkins. Nothing in this closet. Certainly emptied every room thoroughly. Yeah, they sure did. I wonder how Ms. Hopkins found out where her husband was. I don't know. All she told him down at the desk is that she was going to visit him. Maybe she was running away. Yeah, could be. She left this morning, huh? Well, that's what they said. They said she seemed to be in a big hurry, too. Yeah. I guess maybe we better get back to the office, Jim, and just chalk this visit off as a loss. Yeah, looks that way. What do you got there? Hmm? Oh, Here's some health pamphlets I found on the desk over there. Hmm? Listen to this, will you? You can be healthy at 90. Hmm. Life begins at 55, too. And, uh, oh, listen to this one. Bad eaters die young. <laughs> he sounds like a worse hypochondriac than we thought he was. Oh, he certainly does. He sounds like the kind of a... Mike, hey, that might be the answer. What's that? Well, we know he's a hypochondriac, which means he must have a nice, large collection of pills and medicines. That's right. All right, where do you buy pills and medicines? In a drugstore. Right, come on, let's check every drugstore in this neighborhood. Gee, Georgie... Sugar, you're a wonderful dancer. Oh, uh, thanks. Now, aren't you glad you did this? Yeah. You know, I bet you forgot all about your ulcer, too. Well, Helen, to tell you the truth... May I, I cut in? Huh? Alice. What's the matter? Aren't you glad to see your own wife? Helen, why did you throw away those pills? What are you doing here? How did you know where he was? I called his tailor. I knew he couldn't go anywhere without letting him know where to send his clothes. Aren't you ashamed of yourself, young lady, running off with my husband? Oh, stop with that stuff. What about you and Bob Nelson? I got the whole rundown on that one. We're all finished. So are we. Oh, no, we're not. 
I want $25,000 or I go to the cops. Shh, people are looking. I don't care. Besides, it's impolite to discuss money matters in public. Alice, Alice, walk around the floor to our table. Huh? We'll dance over to meet you. Oh, all right. Come on, Helen. Sugar, you're not really going to give her $25,000, are you? Of course not. Well, then why did you... I'm gonna, gonna have her come down to the cottage with us. When we get her there, we'll, uh... We'll lock her in the closet and blow. Oh, but what are you... Quiet. Well, what do we do now? We'll get down to our cottage and talk, Alice. First, though, I've got to pay our check. Waiter! Oh, waiter! Better call for a lawyer, too, Mr. Hopkins. Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. I've got a warrant here for the arrest of all three of you. George, I guess I shouldn't have thrown away those pills. George Hopkins received a 20-year sentence for theft from an interstate shipment. Robert Nelson was sentenced to 10 years and the two women to five years each under the same statute. The clue which led your FBI to George Hopkins came after a check of the drugstores in Hopkins' neighborhood. One of them revealed that he had just ordered a refill on several prescriptions written by a Dr. Elliot. Locating the doctor was a simple matter, and since every hypochondriac notifies his doctor of his every move, the two special agents were able to find out where Hopkins had gone. A quick trip to the resort brought the results you have already seen, the arrest and subsequent conviction of all the criminals involved. When your FBI closes a file like this, a file that has been a major irritant for some time, there is the very human temptation to relax and to enjoy the fruits of victory. But every special agent has been trained to realize that relaxation is not a part of law enforcement. Stop fighting crime for one day, and the crime wave will wash away the hard-won victories of a month. It may be true that there is no rest for the weary, but it is even truer that there is no rest for the members of your FBI. Special agents who have learned that the price of successful law enforcement is the same as the price of liberty, eternal vigilance. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's case from the files of your FBI. Now three final questions on the Equitable Society's Independent 60s plan. Uh, Mr. Keating, I'm 28 years old. Is that too young to start one of these plans? Your Equitable representative will tell you that the sooner you start, the less the plan will cost you each year. But what about the life insurance I already have? Your Equitable representative will show you how to integrate it into your plan. Well, what income will it give me in my 60s? Your Equitable Society representative will give you the exact figure. Either get in touch with him soon or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, a telling story that underlines the nation's number one law enforcement problem. Its subject, juvenile delinquency. Its title, The Remorseful Runaway. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI as a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Remorseful Runaway on This Is Your FBI. The hungry people of Europe must be fed. You can help feed them. Send $10 to CARE, C-A-R-E, New York. Do it today. This program was transcribed. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. This program is transcribed. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. 
presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, nearly four million members are banded together to build better futures for themselves and their families. Their reasons for becoming Equitable Society policyholders are many, but certainly among the most unselfish and far-sighted Equitable Society members are those parents who have seen the wisdom of an Equitable Education Fund. Fathers and mothers, in just 14 minutes, the Equitable Society will tell you how to make sure that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have through an Equitable Education Fund. Tonight's FBI file, The Remorseful Runaway. According to a recent study, the population of the world is increasing by approximately 20 million every year. And of that increase, the population of the United States grows larger by about a million people annually. That extra million human beings in this nation presents a challenge to every citizen, a challenge which must be accepted in equal parts by everyone. What is to happen to them? Will we allow the crime rate to continue to increase even more quickly than the birth rate? Are we to leave to these coming generations a heritage of lawlessness from which no moral structure can be built? If that is not our wish, if we desire to leave them a United States strong in its moral fiber, then the time to act in curbing the crime wave is now. And the problem to attack first in that fight is the problem that more and more becomes the number one worry of every law enforcement agency, the problem which must be solved if any progress is to be made in hurling back the legions of crime the problem of juvenile delinquency. Tonight's file opens in a Midwestern state. A freight train rambles along through the early morning mist. A young boy, having made his way across the tops of several cars, is letting himself down into an empty coal carrier. Go ahead and come, Stevie. There, boy. There. I thought you missed the train. Yeah, I almost did. Stuck on those railroad cops. Well, there'll be days like this, TV. Hey, how did they know we were there? Chance, my boy, poor chance. We were unlucky this time. Maybe next time we... Hey. What's the matter? We got company. Oh, you mean the boy over there? Uh-huh. What's he doing here? I don't know. He was sleeping there when I climbed aboard our little gondola. Hey, it looks like he might be sick or something. I think I'll take a look at him. Hey, don't, don't bother, Stevie. Uh -huh. I've already investigated the situation. He had a cheap watch and a $20 bill on him. Oh, well, where's my cut? Uh, you don't get to cut in on this, Stevie. This is a freelance job. Hey, that ain't fair, Duke. I didn't say it was. I told you many times before, Stevie. Life isn't fair. Why should I be? Well, I guess we're going to stop here. Yeah, it looks that way. Yeah, it looks like our company is awake, too. Yeah. Well, good morning, son. Huh? Who are you? Guests of the railroad. Where are we? Yeah, we're coming into a pleasant little community called Millville. It's one of the finest hobo jungles in the country. Hey, shall we hop off here, Duke? I'm hungry. Sure, sure. I've not eaten since last night. Hey, sorta... my watch is gone. What's that, sir? And my money is gone, too. Well, now, that's too bad, boy. They were in this pocket just before I fell asleep. Oh, now, just a minute, son. I hope you're not accusing me or Stevie here of anything like that. Yes, I am. I want my watch back and my $20. Oh, now, boy. Tony, you took them and I want them back. Shut up. The railroad dicks will be all over us. Hey, that's right. Well, you better be quiet. I won't be quiet. You stole my money. Quiet, lad. Hey, who's in this car? Don't say anything. If you don't come out, I'm coming in. Hey, he's climbing up the ladder. Oh, come here, you. Let go of me. <laughs> Nicely done, Stevie. Come on, we better get out of here. <clears throat> yeah. Good stew, ain't eh, Stevie? Huh? Yeah, yeah, it's real good. Yeah, made it from an old recipe. Given to me by a very famous French vagabond. 
Hey, uh, we staying here long, Duke? Nope. I thought we'd catch the freight that goes by here tonight. Goes all the way to California, son. <laughs> ah, California. <laughs> See me? Did I ever tell you about the time when I was prospecting for gold hey, in hey. California? Hmm? Look who's coming. Oh, the boy from the train. Yeah. Yeah, probably still wants that watch back. Going to give it back to him? <laughs> you know me better than that, Stevie. There's no profit in returning things once... It... <laughs> What's the matter? The watch. I haven't got it. Well, don't look at me that way. I didn't glum it. You sure? Sure. Uh, must have dropped out of my pocket when we jumped off that coal car. Hey, I... I've been looking all over for you. And you found her, son. Good for you. Shows perseverance. I like to see that in a young fella. Mister, I want my watch and my money. Well, I haven't got your watch, boy. Well, what would he want a watch for? He, he tells time by the sun. That's right, boy. I've always lived an outdoor life. Watches are for city folk. Well, somebody took it and my money, too. i got to have money. I've got a long way to go. If you use your wits, son, you can travel around the world without a dime. But I've got to go all the way to Reno. Why? Because... Well, because my mother is there. She's getting a divorce, and I wanted to come home. Look, can you give me enough money to get to Quincy? I can get some money there, and I'll pay you back. Uh, how can you get money in Quincy? Well, my uncle has a business there. He'll give me money. Is that true, son? Oh, sure. He's an automobile dealer. You mean he owns the business? Yeah. Son, we'll give you a hand. Honest? Yes, sir. We'll not only see that you get to Quincy, we'll take you there ourselves. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just approaching the desk of Agent Alan Grayson. Alan, have you heard about the series of robberies done at the freight yard? Yes, Jim. I was on the night desk when a couple of those complaints came in. Oh, well, last night they put some extra railroad police on over at the yards. One of these specials found a young boy and an older man going through a boxcar. Yeah? He found them after they had broken the seal on the car, but he didn't catch them. I see. Special didn't know where they escaped to, but he got a good look at both of them, so he called in their descriptions to us. I hope they were better descriptions than we usually get. Oh, yes, they were. And we know they were good because they've just been verified. How? The railroad police at Millville called us. But they've been caught? No, they got away again. They slugged a railroad policeman there and then ran for it. Any leads on where they might have headed? No, none at all. One unusual thing is that there were three of them in this last assault. They must have found a friend. Mm -hmm. The railroad police found a watch near the car where the slugging took place. They had the initials DGC on the back, along with the numerals 47 and the crest of York Junior High School. We ought to be able to find out who that belongs to. Yes, I should think so. Well, I'm going over to the school now and check through their graduating class of 47 until I find somebody with the initials DGC. <laughs> That boy don't stay in there with his uncle too long. Now, what's your angle on him? Well, he's going to get railroad fare to Reno from his uncle. That should be in the neighborhood of $100. Well, how does that change the price on us? <laughs> You're greener than I thought you were, Stevie. We'll just take whatever he gets. If he comes back here. Stevie, you'll have to learn how to read character. He's a fine, honest boy. Look, just look down. He's just coming out of the showroom. Can you see He's waiting for the lights to change. Yeah, yeah, here he comes. <laughs> I never make a mistake, son, never. Now, I'm afraid I got bad news. Oh, what's wrong, son? My uncle is out of town. He won't be back until late tonight. You never make a mistake? What? Uh, nothing, nothing. Uh, how about your aunt, boy? Won't she give you any money? She's with my uncle. You mean everybody's going from the house? Uh-huh. Uh, can you, can you get into the house, boy? No, I don't know where they keep the key. Well, uh, maybe we could get in without using the key. Oh, no, my uncle wouldn't like that. Well, he wouldn't like to find you in jail when he gets back either. What do you mean? We saw a newspaper while you were in your uncle's showroom, boy. That railroad cop, he's dying. Honest? Uh-huh. And you're as guilty as we are. But I didn't do anything. Now, you don't think you'll be able to convince the police of that, do you, Sonny? You mean they're looking for all three of us? Yes. You've got to get us in that house so as we can hide out until your uncle comes home and gives us enough money to make a getaway. Well... You want us all to go to jail? No. Come on. Hello? 
Alan, I found out who that watch belongs to. That was a quick job, Jim. Well, there was only one graduate with the initials DGC, a youngster named Daniel G. Craig. Did they have anything else on him? Well, I had his address, so I checked her after I left the school. I see. Danny sounds like a nice kid who's in a tough spot. He was running away from some relatives who were caring for him while his mother was in Reno getting a divorce. Oh, another one of those. Uh Uh-huh. I'm afraid divorce and juvenile delinquency go hand in hand. No question about it. The way I figured, Alan, he might have been running away to Reno to be with his mother and just fell in with the other two. That's possible. Oh, while you were out, the chief of police at Quincy called. Oh, what do you want? He'd uh, gotten some word on the trail from the Millville police who interviewed some of the men in a hobo jungle. Uh Uh-huh. They reported that the older man and the two boys had been there and cooked themselves a meal. Yeah. They were heard talking about going to Quincy, which is why Millville called the chief up there. I see. Well, let's call and give them the information we've got about young Craig. Huh? Right. Oh, and Alan, I think we'd better go over to Quincy ourselves. You make the call, I'll tell the boss we're leaving. <laughs> Stevie, this suitcase ought to be big enough. Oh, sure. We can get plenty of stuff in there. Give me that clock on the table. Yeah. Here you are. I might as well take the living cup, too. Hey, we can't get much on that. It's not costing us anything, my boy. Hey, how about this gold cigarette lighter? Oh, I didn't see it. Sure, it's okay. Well, we better not take too much. That kid will be mad when he comes down. Well, it'll take him quite a while to finish talking to his mother. Can't get Reno on the phone in a minute, you know. I think maybe we better duck before he comes back. Sure, sure. Let's not miss anything. Ah, here's where to keep the silver. Give me a hand, son. Ah, okay. That's it. There we are. Yeah. All right, as much as you can. Yeah. Hey, what are you doing? What? <coughs> we are uh, just uh, looking around, son. What's in that bag? Oh, uh, some knickknacks. That's my uncle's stuff. You put those things back. But, my boy, uh, you, you, uh, you're going to need a little extra money for, for magazines and sandwiches on the train. You, you can't travel like a peasant. You were stealing that stuff. Stealing? What? All we're doing is borrowing some of these things to send you to Reno. I don't want to go to Reno that way. Oh, now you're not being fair to yourself, son. We don't want anything for ourselves. You're nothing but crooks. I'm going to call the police. Well, no, you don't want to do that, my boy. You'll just be making trouble for yourself. I don't care. Let them arrest me. I'm not going to let you get... Oh! You're getting very proficient at that, Stevie. Come on, let's finish packing the knickknacks. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. On many a peaceful college campus just one month from now, Thousands of eager college freshmen will hear a bell like this, calling them to their first college class. Yes, next month, half a million young men and women, sons and daughters of farmers, doctors, laborers, and businessmen, will be starting their first year in college. What about your boy, Frank? Are you planning to send him to college when the time comes? I hope so, Mr. Keating. I'd like my kid to have the chance I never had myself. That's a good way to look at it, Frank. And if I were you, I'd make certain of having the money to send him to college. Start right now by setting up an equitable education fund. What's that? A plan for saving money? It's more than that, Frank. It's a complete plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. And once you start, your children are certain to get the funds necessary for their education, regardless of what happens to you. Now, here's how the plan works. First, you start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Second... When your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Third, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payments. If you die, the education fund becomes fully established immediately. Well, that sounds like a real practical idea. Why don't I see someone from the Equitable Society right away? That's it, Frank. Get in touch with an Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard, care of this station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's the way to be sure, with an Equitable Education Fund, that your boy or girl will answer the call of the college bell. (laughs) 
Now back to tonight's file, The Remorseful Runaway. There are few people in the country who are not anxious to see the problem of juvenile delinquency conquered, but for the most part, they feel themselves helpless. They ask in plaintive tones, what can I do? What can any one person do in such a big fight? The answer is that no one person can solve juvenile delinquency just as no one soldier can win a war. But if every soldier adopted the attitude that there was little he could do to help gain victory, there would be no victory. Wherever you are, and whoever you are, you can help fight the battle to prevent our youngsters from becoming criminals. You can help fight it in many ways. One of those ways, and this applies to you whether you are a parent, a teacher, or just a person who occasionally comes in contact with a child, is to teach the child to respect law and order. See that under no circumstances is any criminal ever invested with properties of glamour or bravery. See that any child you discuss the subject with fully understands that the noble qualities are on the side of the law, that the important qualities are those in the motto of your FBI, fidelity, bravery, integrity. Tonight's file continues in a room at police headquarters in Quincy. Alan, I just talked to the chief of police. Nothing's come in on the alarm yet. It doesn't seem possible that all three of them could have come to Quincy and left again without being spotted. No, but if they're here, they're being very quiet. Has young Craig's mother been notified about any of this? Yes. She'll notify us through the office in Reno if she hears from Danny. But I'm afraid we can't wait for that. No. If he's hitching his way, it might take him a couple of... Oh, excuse me. Mm-hmm. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Hello, Taylor. This is Chief Ward. Oh, yes, I'm hello, down the Chief. Hall of my office. You got word on the Craig boy? Huh? You've located him? Yes, his uncle, a man named Russell, got home this afternoon from a business trip and found young Craig unconscious in the living room floor. I see. Have you spoken to the boy? Yes, just finished. He mm-hmm. said that the old man, the other young boy he was with on the train, came to his uncle's house with him. Mm-hmm. Said that he went upstairs to call his mother in Reno, but couldn't get through to her, and that when he came down, he found them robbing the house. Is that when they knocked him out? Yeah, threatened to call the police, and the other young boy hit him on the head from behind. Chief, could he tell you who the other two were? that the older man's name is Duke and the young boy's first name is Stevie. Duke and Stevie. Well, I'm afraid that isn't going to be much help. Well, I've got a list of things that were stolen if you want it. Yes, that's fine, Chief. Thanks. I'll come down to your office for the list. But don't rain. Why, why? What difference does the weather make? Rain brings the flowers, Stevie. And where'd you say that guy was? The fence? Uh-huh. Yeah, it's not very far now. But you said you wasn't here in such a long time. How do you know this guy? <laughs> I was selling him stuff before you were born, Stevie. He was buying some of my valuables far back as uh, 1920. Well, that's a long time ago. You sure it's on his block? Yep. It's right around this corner. This bag's getting heavy. It's good for your muscles. Yeah, I know. You said that before. Well, I'll be. Well, what's the matter? You see that empty lot across the street? Uh-huh. That's where the fence store used to be. Oh, no. Now, what do we do now? Son, I guess I've been a failure with you. You haven't learned the most important thing I've tried to teach you. Uh, now what? I've tried to tell you that the successful thief is the one who doesn't get discouraged. You've got to be able to improvise as you go along. The fence is gone. We've got to accept that. Now there's only one thing to do. Go to some other pawn shop. Come on, man. Come on. Danny, this is Special Agent Taylor. Jim, this is Danny Craig. Hello, Danny. Hello, Mr. Taylor. Sit down, son. Make yourself comfortable. Thank you, sir. The alarm has gone out on that list of things that were stolen from Danny's uncle's house. Oh, that's fine, Alan. I think I'll go out by the desk just in case somebody calls in with a report. Okay, Alan. See you later. Well, Danny, I'd like to ask you a few questions. All right, Mr. Taylor. What made you run away in the first place? I wanted to be with my mother. 
I didn't want to live with my aunt. Have you spoken to your mother? Yes, I spoke to her this morning. You going out to Reno to be with her? No, sir. She's coming back home to be with me and Pop. Hey, that's fine. I'm glad to hear it. That ought to make you feel pretty important. Yes, sir. Well, now, Danny, what can you tell me about Duke and Stevie? Well, I think I told the police pretty nearly everything I remembered. Mm -hmm. Well, let's find out if I've got all the facts straight, huh? Now, the first thing that happened was... Oh, excuse me, Danny. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Uh, it's Chief Warren again, Taylor. Yes, Chief. That pair who knocked out young Craig just tried to sell their loot. They did where? Pawn shop on Main and Third Streets. The owner didn't want to buy anything from them, so no, so they left. How long ago was that, Chief? Oh, about half an hour ago, mm -hmm. just before we sent out the alarm to the pawn shop so the list of stolen goods. Well, they might still be in the neighborhood. Chief, I think we'll use that car you lent us and do some cruising. <laughs> covered this territory pretty well, Jim. Yeah. I don't see how they could have gotten too far. That stuff must be pretty heavy. Uh, a warrant in the car 21. Yes, come in, Chief. There's a teletype here from your home office. Will you read it to me, please? Yeah. Reads, uh, nickname, file, Washington. Reveals man being searched for. Answers description, Edward Mason, known as Duke. FBI circular 17342-47. All right, thanks, Chief. I looked up the circular we had on file. Mason has been arrested 23 times over a period of 35 years. Uh, tell me, is there anything predominant in the record? Well, 11 of the arrests were for breaking into and entering sealed freight cars. I see. Hey, just a moment, Taylor. Car 9's calling in. Well, at least we know who we're looking for. Yeah, yeah it's a help. I wish we could get some kind of a lead before it gets dark. I'm afraid we're going to have to, Ellen. If they get the advantage of another night, they might be able to get out of town. Well, we've got to catch them while it's still light. Warren, the car 21. Come in, Chief. That was Patrolman Page in car 9, Taylor. Mason and the young boy went to a pawn shop at Oliver and Fifth Street. Good. Have they been apprehended? Oh, the pawnbroker had already received the alarm, but when he tried to hold them, the young boy knocked him down. They got away. I see. All squad cars in the street have joined in the search. Okay. Thanks, Chief. Jim, we'd better get over there, hadn't we? I don't think so, Alan. Huh? Well, we're going to wait right here. I've got a hunch they're headed this way. Uh, let's hop into this car, son. Hey, but there's no engine on this car. Yeah, there will be. Go ahead, jump up. Hey, you want some help? No, I can make it. Sit down until she starts. Yeah, but first, uh, give me a hand. We'll close this door. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You shouldn't have left that suitcase, son. That was too heavy to run with. I know, I know. But a man don't get many chances like that. When he does... You ought to take advantage of him. Uh, sure, that's easy for you to talk. Uh, I was the one carrying <laughs> If I were ten years younger, then I carried the bag, and you too. Oh, you're always saying if. <laughs> that's because all life is a gamble, son. If you go one way, you win. If you go the other way, you lose. <laughs> yep. If is a mighty big word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know where this train is headed? Certainly. It's 518 out of here. Doing San Francisco on Thursday morning. Are we going all the way? Yep. Yeah. That's the engine being hooked on. Well, if I had that watch, I could tell you just how soon we'd be pulling out. Well, it can't be too fast for me. <laughs> See, huh? Ratting out. Why shall I in here, Alan? Okay, Jim. Can't see anything. Yeah, let me have it for a minute. Yeah. You're right. Let's go down to the next car, Jim. Hey, wait. There they are. Hey, they faked. All right, you two. Come on out of there. Uh, 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 just a minute, gentlemen. Uh, are you uh, fellow officials of the railroad? No. We're special agents of the FBI. Now, come on. The 
criminal known as Edward Duke Mason received a 20-year sentence for larceny. His young accomplice was sentenced to 10 years for theft from interstate shipment. When Special Agent Taylor received word over the two-way radio from Chief Warren that the pair being searched for had fled from a pawn shop, he was driving past the freight yards. Because Duke Mason had been arrested 11 times for having broken into freight cars, Special Agent Taylor correctly assumed that he would head for the nearest railroad yard. And thus, a man who corrupted the lives of approximately a dozen children in the past whom he had talked to steal was apprehended by the closely knit actions of a local police department and two agents of your FBI. This case, like so many others in the files, could not have been closed without the invaluable aid rendered by a local law enforcement agency. Ordinarily, such smaller agencies remain unnoticed and unsung. And for that reason, your FBI wishes to salute the local police throughout the nation. Without them, law and order would be impossible to maintain. For these men, your local police, form your first line of defense against the common enemy, America's army of criminals. In a moment, we will tell you about next week's case from the files of your FBI. Now, here's a man who has a point he'd like clarified. Well, it's about that equitable education fund, Mr. Keating. Suppose I should get in an accident and become disabled. Well, what happens? Do I have to drop the fund? No. That's the beauty of this plan. If you are totally or permanently disabled, you won't have to make any further payments. But the fund will go right on building up. It's one of many fine features that your Equitable Society representative will explain to you in detail. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A story that describes the involved workings of professional swindlers. Its subject, extortion. Its title, The Wrong Way Shakedown. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Wrong Way Shakedown on This Is Your FBI. Forest fires last year ruined enough timber to build about 86,000 homes, and we're coming into another forest fire season. So be particularly careful with cigarette ashes, matches, and campfires. This program was transcribed. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.